Amen. To God be the glory. Thank you, ladies. We, uh, I want to welcome you here. My name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for uh, this class. Uh, I think that today is our final uh, week for our mini-series, and I hope that many have come to join us and will stay for the completion of the John study. Uh, I do want to uh, let you know that we have one announcement, and unfortunately, Angie is out recovering from eye surgery, and so we have had to cancel our homiletic seminar. I do ask that you keep her in prayer along with her family, and she will be out for several weeks. And so we will wait in anticipation to see what the testimony is that she will give us about how God provided and all of his provisions. To God be the glory. Thank you, ladies. I think that that is it for uh, the announcements. We will have the outline up for a few minutes. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started on the lecture. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here with you today, Lord. We thank you that your presence is with us. For those that believe the Holy Spirit is indwelt in them, Lord, and thank you that we know you in the pardon of our sins. Lord, if there's anyone in earshot who doesn't know you in the pardon of their sins, I ask, Lord, that they would come today to know you and to have saving faith and saving grace in Jesus Christ alone. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. All right, ladies, we're going to get started. Today, I want you to keep your pulse on our big idea. Our big idea today is that physical, temporal mindset versus eternal spiritual mindset. When we start our days, especially for mine, it includes prioritizing all the things, right? All the things, right? It also, uh, for me, includes the things that I have to do regarding my family, but also the things that I need to do regarding BSF, right? And all the rest of the day's activities. It is effortless to put all things that God has given me to do as, as the forefront, right? But the most important thing is my spiritual what? Mindset, right? Not just all the details regarding things that need to go on with BSF, but the time that I spend meditating with God on his word and letting him speak to me, right? Because, amen, that's right. Because that is what is most important. The spiritual mindset, the mindset of the one who does the what? Supernatural empowering, right? He equips us to do all things to do all the things, amen, that we need to do. Our task and the very things that he has called us to do. So I was thinking about what illustration I wanted to use today. And many years ago, I used to uh, make terrariums, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I made them, but I may not be pronouncing the name right. But I thought that it was really interesting that when you make these, you start off with rocks, right? That's like the first layer. And then you have the charcoal, right? And then you have the potting soil. Then you have the plants, right? And so I kind of made me think about God, his word, the solid rock, right? And then the charcoal, which is like a little bit of the activation. So God is using his believers to go around and to activate, right? And so we putting out our soil and then we have the plants, right? Well, with a terrarium, you water it. And when you water it with the rain, that's Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, bringing the rain. It goes all the way down to the rocks. And do you know that in a terrarium, it makes its own, like, climate, atmosphere? Wow. So the sunlight comes in, and it's keeping its own, what, atmosphere. So when Jesus comes in to us, he keeps us. He keeps us in perfect, what, peace, no matter what is going on. When we are doing the things that he has spiritually called us to, we get a supernatural empowering. So the things that are going on in the outer atmosphere, like with your terrarium, what's going on in the outside 
doesn't affect it because it's made its what? Own climate, own atmosphere, right? Praise the Lord. I hope you could see that illustration because my husband was like, no, nah, don't do that one. But God said, move forward. So, hey, he trumps everything, right? Because we're operating what? Not in the natural, but in the what? Supernatural. And so, praise God for that illustration. Today, ladies, uh, we are going to dive into the Gospel of John, and uh, especially chapter 4 in the verses 31 through 54, where we find powerful lessons on faith, healing, and belief. These passages take us on a journey from doubt to unwavering faith, and we'll explore the transformative power of encountering Jesus. And what I hope we learn today, which is our aim, is eternal priorities matter more than temporal pleasures. Eternal priorities, right, matter more than temporal pleasures. Praise the Lord. Our, uh, that was our aim, okay? Our eternal priorities matter more than temporal pleasures. So we have three uh, divisions today, ladies. And our first division is Jesus taught his disciples about the spiritual harvest. We're going to see that in John chapter 4, verses 31 through 38. And then our second division is many Samaritans believed in Jesus. That's in John chapter 4, uh, verses 39 through 42. And our third division, Jesus healed a royal official son and his household believed. That's John 4, 43 through 54. So let's take a look at what's going on here, okay? So the disciples are confused, just like we get confused, right? Okay? Because they see Jesus, what? He's talking to the Samaritan woman. And we dug into that last week and explained what was going on behind the difference between what the Jews and the what Samaritans, their history, right? So they don't understand the depths of the spiritual nourishment that Jesus is offering her. Like these disciples, we often misunderstand God's plans for, our, for us, right? Focusing on our physical, right, instead of the spiritual. If you haven't already done so, please open your Bibles to John chapter 4, verse 31. We're going to look at verse 31. We encounter the disciples' confusion they had just returned with food and were puzzled at Jesus' behavior. This confusion is a reminder that just like the disciples, we often struggle to understand God's ways in our lives. There is more to life than physical satisfaction and pleasant circumstances. I can attest to that, y'all. Jesus tells us that a true disciple holds a different perspective of what is valuable, right? So that means we can let down our emotions, all the things, even our intellect, and do what he's called us to do despite all the circumstances, because we're looking at it with a spiritual perspective, right? It changes us but not necessarily the what, the outer circumstances. I know you all could testify to that. The disciples are concerned for Jesus, and they urge him to eat. Highlights the human perspective, right? They were focused on the physical needs, not comprehending the deeper spiritual work that Jesus was involved in. Jesus uses this opportunity, like he does in our lives, to teach his disciples about spiritual nourishment. His statement highlights the difference between earthly nourishment and soul-satisfying nourishment found in doing God's will. This is a profound lesson in prioritizing the spiritual over the physical. So we see in verse 33, then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? The disciples' dialogue reveals their confusion they are so entrenched in their understanding of physical needs that they struggle to understand Jesus' spiritual message. Their conversation mirrors our human tendencies to doubt or misunderstand God's intention. 
I know that this is repetitive, but it's important that we get what's going on here. Our first principle, ladies, is there is nothing more ultimately satisfying than doing God's will. There is nothing more ultimately satisfying than doing God's will. So in verse 34, it says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Amen. That was our prayer today. And when I visited one of the discussion groups, it was also what that came out, which is what, what do we want to hear ultimately is that God says, well done, good, and thy faithful servant. I want to hear that. In this verse, Jesus provides clarity. He explains that his substance comes from fulfilling God's purpose and completing his work. This highlights the importance of aligning our lives with God's will and recognizing the true, true source of spiritual nourishment. So we're going to see in verses 35 through 38. Don't you have a saying, a saying that still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. Okay? So in our second principle, ladies, it says God is calling you to invest in his harvest. Second principle, God is calling you to invest in his harvest. Jesus used this moment to teach the disciples about spiritual harvest. He draws parallels between the physical harvest and the readiness of people's what? Hearts to receive the gospel, right? These verses emphasize the urgency of spiritual mission and encourage believers to recognize opportunities for evangelism. That's what we should be doing, recognizing opportunities in our everyday life. By constantly nourishing our spiritual lives, we uh, equip ourselves to recognize the spiritual harvest around us. We become more aware of opportunities for sharing the gospel and living out God's purpose. In a world filled with distractions, Staying spiritually nourished is a crucial practice that enables us to align our lives with God's will. Praise the Lord. All right, so a balanced scale with spiritual and the physical needs highlights the importance of nourishing both aspects of our lives, right? Because we got to eat too, right? So we don't want to just be, you know, unbalanced. Just remember that, okay? Because I know sometimes we can take it from one end to the other, right? So we want to live and have balanced lives, right? As we examine the disciples' confusion, we must acknowledge the tendency to prioritize our physical needs over what? Our spiritual nourishment. We often get so caught up, right, in the busyness of life, fulfilling our physical needs, and what? Striving for success that we neglect our spiritual well-being. Sometimes there is a saying that people will say, if Satan can't get you off track, he'll keep you so busy, right? Amen. Just as Jesus emphasized the importance of spiritual nour nourishment, we should have time in prayer, meditation, and studying God's word. Our lives must have a balance between physical and spiritual needs. Amen. Let us remember the words of Jesus. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Just as Jesus found nourishment and fulfilling God's purpose, we too can find true nourishment by aligning our lives with God's will, doing his work and recognizing the abundant spiritual harvest ready for our attention. And no matter what our platforms are, there is work that God has us to do that is uniquely divine. Whether we be on the battlefield, there's a work for us to do there because this is a spiritual battlefield, but God may actually call us to some, our children, to what? A real battlefield, right? But there is something to do at every place that God puts us. 
So we're going to look at uh, the verses of uh, th uh, verses 39 through 42, okay? We witness the amazing transformation of the Samaritan woman after her encounter with Jesus. Her testimony becomes a pivotal moment in her community, right? Amen. Illustrating the profound impact of a personal encounter with Christ. The Samaritans in her town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony, her openness, and the fact that Jesus knew everything about her life had a significant impact on the Samaritans. They went a step further, right? Inviting Jesus to what? Stay, which was for a remarkable act of faith, given the historical tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. Jesus' words had a compelling effect, drawing even more people to faith. This indicates that the initial belief sparked by the woman's testimony, the Samaritan woman's testimony, testimony deepened as the Samaritans heard Jesus teach. The transformation was complete when the Samaritans acknowledged that their belief wasn't just based on what? Solely on the woman's testimony, right? They had experienced Jesus for themselves. That's what we need to experience Jesus for ourselves and recognize him as our Lord and Savior of this world. This verse emphasizes the importance of personal encounters with Christ and strengthening one's faith. Amen. A single conversation with a stranger sharing our faith can impact others. The transformation of the Samaritan woman and the subsequent conversion of her community provides us with valuable lessons for our own lives. Her story reminds us the power of sharing our personal encounters with Jesus. It is important and necessary. In our context, this application takes on a great significance. We live in a world where testimonies and personal experience hold tremendous weight. The Samaritan woman's testimony not only led to the initial belief of her fellow townspeople, but also played a vital role in deepening their faith. We can apply this by sharing our own faith stories. Your personal experience, encounters with Jesus, and moments of transformation are powerful tools in evangelism. When you share your testimony, you open the door for others to experience Jesus for themselves. Just as the ripples in a pond spread outward, into a single drop, your testimony can impact those around you and beyond. It has the potential to inspire belief in Christ, just as the Samaritan woman's encounter inspired her community. Don't underestimate the significance of your personal faith story in the lives of others. Amen. When we share our stories on how Christ has transformed our lives, we become agents of what? Hope and a witness to the life-changing power of the Savior. Remember, it's not about what you say. It's about the authenticity of your experience and transformative power of the message you convey. Your testimony can be a bridge that leads others to encounter Jesus for himself. I challenge you today, go out and try it. See what happens. Jesus, after his time in Samaria, he departs from Galilee, which sets the stage for what? The royal officials plea for help. May we all go down to Jesus for help. In verse 46, a certain royal official who comes to Jesus in desperate need for his son's healing, it's essential to remember the significance of the location. It's in where? Cana, right? 
where Jesus previously performed a miraculous sign of turning what? Water into wine. So our third principle, ladies, God works through desperate situations to challenge our focus and build our faith. The royal official story shows us an inspiring example of faith. His son is seriously ill, and the urgency of this to his situation is evident as he pleads for Jesus for help. The royal official seeks Jesus' intervention with steadfast trust and humility. We all face, right, moments of crisis, uncertainty in our lives where our faith can be severely tested. In such times, the story of the royal official teaches us the importance of faith and trust in Jesus alone. Here are some things we can apply to our own lives from this story. Urgency and faith, right? You should write this down. The royal official's urgency in seeking Jesus serves as a reminder that when facing challenges, we should turn to God without delay. Our faith should drive us to seek his intervention promptly. Number two, persistence in prayer. Despite the initial response from Jesus, the royal official persists in his plea. This demonstrates the power of persistent prayer and faith. We should be unwavering in our trust, even when circumstances seem dark or dim. Humility, that's number three. The royal official approaches Jesus with humility, acknowledging his need and recognizing Jesus as the authority. Humility is our, is our faith. Humility in our faith helps us to open our hearts to God's guidance and intervention. Number four, trust in God's timing. Royal, the royal official story also highlights the need to trust in God's timing, right? His son's healing was recognized at the very moment Jesus declared it. Sometimes God answers to our prayers may not align with our timeline. But we must trust his perfect timing. Amen. He may not come when you want, but he's always right on time. Hallelujah. Number five, unshaken belief. In the face of adversity, the royal official faith remained unshaken, right? We should hold on to our belief in Jesus' ability to bring healing and restoration regardless of the challenge we face. So we're going to see in verses 50 through 53, the royal official takes Jesus at his word and departs. On his journey back home, he receives the joyous news of his son's miraculous recovery. In verse 54, this was the second sign Jesus performed after coming to Judea to Galilee, right? It shows Jesus' ability to heal from a distance and the transformative power of belief. Jesus demonstrated God's grace by teaching his disciples, by seeing the Samaritan woman come to faith, and by drawing the royal official to saving faith and healing his son. Jesus reached out to the needy people in a way that revealed his gracious pursuit of human hearts. God's grace is his unmerited favor for the undeserving people like me and people like you. In kindness and, compa and compassion, Jesus' nature leads him to bestow benefits that cannot be earned. All humanity experiences God's common grace and goodness that flows from his creation and provisions. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. All blessings, even when unacknowledged, flow from God himself. 
God's free gift of salvation most abundantly demonstrates what? Grace that we should also extend to others. Through the sacrifice of his own son to pay sin's penalty, all who believe in him are justified and declared righteous on Christ's merit, not their own. Salvation cannot be earned by good works, but comes by grace through faith in Christ alone. God's grace continues to pour onto believers as they walk with Christ and grow towards spiritual maturity. When I don't believe in God's grace, I have the wrong view of God and myself and leads me to seek to earn God's favor, which I cannot do. I fail to see God as kind and what? Approachable. I cannot understand God's gift of salvation without embracing his grace. But when I believe that God himself is full of grace and that he freely extends grace to me, I can approach him humbly and confidently. I trust in his provisions of salvation rather than my own brutal efforts. Anything God, anything good, it, anything good is God, right? And my life comes as a gift of his abundant grace. Praise the Lord. My, my nature, right, by nature, God is what? He's gracious, right? We know that. He loves to reach towards the undeserving, bless you with compassion and kindness. How are you helped to know that God looks at you with a merciful willingness to extend grace? Everything God does reflects all that he is. God's actions express grace while also upholding all his other what? Attributes, right? In what specific ways has God extended grace to you? God's grace establishes sustains and grows our faith. We stand in need of God's grace at every turn. Wow, amen. And he offers it in abundant supply. Think about your most pressing concern or trial today. How are you experiencing God's sustaining grace? As recipients of God's lavish grace, we should freely extend grace to others. Belief is not just about the miraculous, right? We know that. But it's about the transformative power it has over our lives and the lives of those around us. We need to apply our faith to our circumstances. Whether we are facing challenges, uncertainties, or opportunities, belief should guide our decisions, our actions, and interactions with others. Like Jesus' statement about the rippled fields, we, excuse me, the ripe fields, we should be attentive to the opportunity to share the gospel in our lives. The fields are ready for harvest. People's hearts are prepared to receive the message of Christ. We must be ready to sow the seed of faith. So ladies, as we look at the conclusion, we can learn from John chapter 4, verses 31 through 54, that these verses are not just what? Historical facts. I wish I would have said that every single week, and I probably have. They're not just historical accounts, but they offer timeless wisdom, lessons, and inspiration for all our journey of faith. That's what we're on, a faith journey. Divine wisdom and guidance is found in God's word. These verses resonate with us, reminding us of the enduring power of faith, transformative impact on personal encounters with Jesus, and application of belief beyond signs and wonders. May we go forth applying lessons of our lives, right? These lessons to our lives. As we encounter Jesus, may we share our faith stories, maintain unwavering trust in challenging times, and 
believe. Amen. I'm going to close this in prayer. We're right on time. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what you've done today and what you continue to do, what you've done in the past and what you will do in the future, Lord. We are so uh, grateful that we get to come together, Lord, to acknowledge that you are where our help comes from, that we need you, Lord. We need your word. This is our solid rock, our solid foundation. And without you, Lord, we're nothing. So I thank you, Heavenly Father. I give you praise and honor because you're worthy. There is no other God before you. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.